and welcome to Phoenix Talent Talks in partnership with The Business Post. The topic of this, our fifth episode, is Recover and Rebuild. I'm your host, Elena Regan, and I'm joined here today by Ed Rossiter, founder and managing partner at Phoenix, Anne O'Dwyer, managing director at Duffin Phelps in Ireland, and Tom Early, head of equity and legal at Enterprise Ireland. Uh, firstly, thank you all for taking part here today. So Ed, I'm going to start with you today. Uh, based on your work at Phoenix, uh, you're dealing with companies and candidates all the time as a professional recruiter. Um, is there a sense now, from your point of view, that they have moved from a reactive phase and into recovery mode? Hey, Elaine, it's, uh, it's great to be back on another episode of Talent Talks. Um, so yeah, look, the, the last number of months, of course, have been very, very tricky. And I think what we're starting to see now is the emergence of essentially a two-speed type economy. For a lot of our clients in the services sector, they have had to drastically change how they work. But fortunately, in a lot of ways, COVID hasn't prohibited them from working at all. So the unfortunate side to, to COVID has been, of course, the hospitality and tourism sectors where places of work have actually physically been shut. So I think the recovery period for them has been well documented and it's going to be a lot longer maybe than other sectors that we would work in. For a lot of our clients, the initial shock of having to implement the correct infrastructure and even the cybersecurity side of, of working remotely was very, very intense. And we saw a lot of our clients essentially focus on their people, the security and the health of their people to make sure that they can continue in some way, shape or form. But after that initial shock period, I guess a lot of companies have readjusted quite well and have been working very well remotely. Um, and as we hopefully come out of what's been the worst period related to COVID, although the last few days in Dublin has been interesting, we're hopefully going to see a, a more blended approach to, to working from home. And I think the remote working piece is, is set to become one of COVID's most notable employment related legacies um, and learning to manage more flexible workforces. And that's going to be a priority, I think, for employers going forward. I know the theme of this uh, podcast is recover and rebuild. Um, based on your own day-to-day -day experience, is there really a sense now that companies have moved from a reactive phase and into recovery mode? I guess it does come back to the, to the sector of, of, of focus that you're, you're talking about, right? But in the sectors that we would focus on across the professional, corporate and, and financial services sectors, uh, we do believe so. Even just talking from our own experience when COVID and, and lockdown happened initially, we quickly looked at our own business to try and, and make sure that everyone internally was, was well looked after and, and could remote work effectively. But we split our projects, our, our clients into three separate categories, I guess. And we had one for businesses that were looking to, to do business critical hires. They had to hire and a lot of those companies would have been uh, high growth businesses or new entrants into the Irish markets. And a good example of that would be the, uh, the number of legal uh, firms, international legal firms that have established a, a base in Ireland and their business was was dependent on hiring people throughout this period and their future business growth plans were there to be obtained anyway. So I guess from a second category, we, we looked at companies that were pausing recruitment efforts to see how the next few months played out. And I guess the, the third category, I guess um, a lot of companies had just scrapped their recruitment plans for the year due to the sectors that they had been in. Thankfully, we actually had quite a lot of projects in the first and second category. And I think the last four or six weeks for us has been very positive with, with companies now looking to actually get back into the recruitment cycle and, and try and acquire some really good talent coming into the back end of the year. One, I guess, feedback from, from a number of our clients actually is they're, they're a little bit regretful that they stopped recruiting because performance from a business perspective, depending on the sector that they're in, of course, hasn't been as disastrous as they may have imagined initially so keeping the, the recruitment efforts going is, is something that they're keen to do coming into the back end of the year the one issue that we have seen across most businesses has actually been the uh, future business development aspect how are, are companies trying to attract new clients and customers that may have been traditionally reliant on traditional face-to-face -face meetings or presentations or pitches so we, we've seen a number of our, our clients and businesses develop a far stronger digital strategy around trying to attract new customers by increasing their digital footprint across social media. Or I think we've all seen the amount of webinars and value add content that has been out there over the last number of months. But that's probably been the one concern we've heard most from, from clients. When you do remove that face-to-face -face interaction, how does the future pipeline of business look? And how can we be a little bit more innovative to, to create that demand? 
And I'm going to bring you in here um, at Duff and Phelps. You've been working with a lot of Irish companies in the last few months, helping them to move on from that initial shock we all experienced back in March. What kind of work have you been doing with them? Yeah, a lot of what we've been doing over the last six months has been focused on helping companies figure out what life is going to look like in a post-COVID world and how best to trade out of it if they even can. You know, back in March, we saw overnight how businesses had to kind of temporarily close their door and there wasn't adequate time or funding really to arrange an orderly closure. In a lot of cases, balance sheets were effectively frozen and businesses were, were, were mothballed. So over the summer, as some of the government imposed restrictions were relaxed, and operations that had been mothballed started to re-emerge. We've seen some for sectors being able to obviously go further down the line than others and obviously some potentially having to go backwards again now with um, level three kicking in in Dublin. Despite the fact that the last six months have been very challenging for businesses, we have seen owners take a hard look at their cost base to see where potential streamlining or savings could be made and more importantly, really actioning that plan. We're all probably getting a little bit fatigued hearing about cash flow and working capital management, but it's just so essential to ensure business survival and more importantly, to help guide that rebuild or the reboot or the flex really going forward. If the company runs out of cash, then it's game over. And that's really what we're trying to avoid when we're, we're working with companies. One of the key things that we've seen businesses look at is obviously the cost base. That mothball period gave companies clarity on what the real fixed cost base for the business actually was. And it also gave time to assess if all those costs were going to be needed going forward. Some really difficult decisions had to be made around staff numbers and whether redundancies were needed. The wage subsidy supports have probably allowed some of those decisions to be moved further down the road as the real wage bill hasn't properly fully kicked back in yet for many companies. I think we're going to see this issue re-emerge after the 31st of March when the current wage support is due to end and with further impact and reassessment coming down for a lot of businesses. Landlord negotiations have been key over the last few months and our real estate advisory team have been very busy in this area on two main fronts. I suppose firstly, there's the affordability factor and secondly, there's the question of whether that space is going to be needed going forward with smaller contracted businesses and also with so much of the workforce working remotely. On the affordability front, we have seen some supportive landlords who've agreed positions on arrears that have been built up over the COVID period with lease restructurings being agreed and that's given businesses clarity going forward and has also had a positive impact on their cash flow management. Some landlords have taken a harder view and in many cases that's really a result of their own financial position with their bank. So look, there's no easy win for everyone here. We've also seen businesses decide that space just isn't going to be needed going forward and that the lease, even on a restructured basis, just isn't going to be affordable. Some companies use the examinership process to address this issue and, and other supplier issues, and they look to repudiate cost prohibitive um, leases under the examinership process. But examinership in its current form is an expensive court process and it's not suitable for all businesses, particularly SMEs. And that's where informal negotiations with landlords and key suppliers is more appropriate and cost effective. And we've seen a lot of that take place over recent months. Overall, I think that uh, many businesses are still operating in a tough environment, but they're coming out fitter and leaner with a much better understanding of their cash management. And I think that's really going to help businesses as they move forward post-COVID. Uh, Tom, what is your sense at Enterprise Ireland of the state of play now for Irish businesses. Are they doing enough to move confidently into 2021? Thanks, Elaine. Okay, I suppose that's a bit of a multifaceted question because uh, I suppose at Enterprise Ireland, we have about 5,000 clients and they're across multiple sectors, different stages in their life cycles. They come in all shapes and sizes. So we've got like a lot of early stage uh, startups and they go right through all the way to the large internationally trading companies. So some of our clients are flaring very well. You know, the crisis has actually worked out quite well for them. Prime example would be someone like Web Doctor. They were able to adapt their offering and basically now they offer uh, GPs a way to virtually meet their clients and, and they've partnered with the HSC. Or if you look at someone like Nearform, whose uh, software for the COVID tracing app is basically being used worldwide. Then we've got other clients who, you know, they were just able to seize new opportunities going out of the areas that they normally would be trading in. Someone like, say, Ventec, who provide noise control solutions for vehicles and buildings. And they've turned around and, and now we're producing a PPE. And then there are some companies 
companies like Tick itself and Bazimply and, and, you know, and sort of reference to some of these, these guys are in the hospitality sectors, servicing them. And, and, and overnight, their sales just completely uh, disappeared. And, and they were forced to be very, very creative in terms of how they were doing it. Now, happily, uh, both those scenarios, uh, they've turned around their business and a lot of the supports were there to do it. So I suppose what I'd say in terms of the state of play that's there now for Irish businesses, it's, um, it's change. And, and it's really, really rapid change um, with huge uncertainty. And it's, and it's not just COVID we're talking about here as well. I mean, we've got Brexit that's looming around the corner as well and, and all the uncertainty that that brings. Wasn't it Charles Darwin who said it, it's not the strongest of the species that survives uh, or the most intelligent, but the one that's most adaptable to change? And I suppose that's what I'd be saying to companies now is, is that, you know, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of challenges co- coming up ahead. So they need to be able to, to respond to that. So uh, as Anne was mentioning, there you know we've seen a lot of companies that they've they've retrenched for want of a better word they've battened down the hatches there's a lot of cost reductions they've made themselves leaner and they were using their own funds you know not wanting to take any more debt and and you know in some instances they're kind of hoping that eventually everything will right itself i mean even if you just look at what's happened this week and the fact is now you know the the likelihood that we're going to stage three if we haven't uh, already gone to stage three and what that's meant when everybody thought that the the economy was opening back up so you know it's a real case of we're we're in in different times and companies need to sort of uh, figure out how to operate in these times i mean that's why we actually introduced the business financial planning grant it was actually to help companies move forward into 2021 with a degree of confidence I, I, sorry, I should say, I mean, that's that's a, like a, a 5K grant to work with with third parties to develop a strategy to deal with the crisis. So it's actually working with, with, with people like Anne there uh, in, in terms of uh, they hold up a mirror to companies and say, look, you know, what is it you're doing? What scenarios could you consider? You've got limited resources. What's the best way to figure that out? You know, Connor Shaw's the CEO of Bizimply. He shared his experience with everyone about how he's gone about weathering the storm. And I think, and to quote him on this, it's like, you're going to have to unlearn some of the stuff that led to your past success give up things that were previously held sacred and stay focused on on the future. So I suppose, you know, for companies to move into 2021 with a, a degree of confidence, you know, they, they do need to have a plan B. Their market may not come back as quickly as as they want or even at all. So, so I mean, that's why we set up the Sustaining Enterprise Fund and it's to help companies, to give them room, to give them oxygen, to, to you know, uh, an opportunity to move forward with confidence. So, Tom, I'd like to come back to the Sustaining Enterprise Fund again a little bit later on and find out a bit more about that. But just uh, in terms of the business financial planning grant that you mentioned there, Anne, I'd like to bring you in here and talk to you a little bit about that and the other supports that are available to help companies now through the pandemic. Are they making enough use of them? Yeah, I think actually, Elaine, the second part of that question there is so interesting. It still really surprises me when I'm talking to companies how many businesses aren't um, fully availing of the supports that are out there. And I think some of that is down to maybe some supports getting a bit more airtime than others. Um, you can find a full list of all the supports um, available on the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation website. So I definitely recommend people um, having a look at, at that. You can click on the link of the support that would be most you feel is most appropriate to your business and more importantly it shows you how to avail of it so I think that that website is probably underutilized maybe by, by, by many companies. In terms of the supports I'm a big fan of the financial planning grant um, with Enterprise Ireland I think it's a fantastic um, support for businesses. We've been doing a lot of work with Enterprise Ireland clients and I've been kind of when I'm talking to companies around using that that grant I'm saying coming out of this business plan this is should be your roadmap for how you're moving the business forward over the next few years this is the report that you're using to go and talk to your lenders go and talk to Enterprise Ireland and flex that plan as you go forward so I think it's a great tool to stop assess your business think and and really build the plan going forward so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of that of that one in particular but maybe I might just go through some of the other supports that are out there and I won't go through them all because I'd be here all day. But 
there is, I suppose, the July stimulus package did give some clarity and improvement on a number of the supports. Um, I think the one that probably most companies are very familiar with and are availing of is the employment wage subsidy scheme, which replaced the temporary wage subsidy scheme during the summer. Um, for a company to be eligible for the scheme, they've got to show that they're operating at no more than 70% of turnover compared to 2019. The positives on the revised scheme compared to the previous one are that I suppose mainly clarity has been given in the fact that it's in place until the 31st of March 2021 and also some of the employee eligibility criteria have also been removed so for example new hires and seasonal workers may now um, be eligible for it. The scheme gives €203 Euro per week for employees that earn €203 Euro or more per week and €150 Euro per week for anyone below that. I think that the TWSS and now the EWSS have been absolute lifelines for so many businesses over the last few months. And it's great to have clarity that they're now going to be in place until at least the end of March next year. But one of the challenges I think that is coming early next year is what happens after the 31st of March. Um, as I, and I mentioned it earlier in terms of where companies have been looking at their cost base and in terms of restructuring, you know, we've been able to rely on the wage subsidy support for the moment and now until the 31st of March. And as we know, certain sectors have just been decimated by covid tourism and hospitality I suppose are the ones that are in the spotlight a lot but as Tom mentioned we also have our old favourite Brexit coming back down the line so I don't think it's going to work for the EWSS to just drop off a cliff at the end of March it's going to be interesting to see what the government proposed to do as go forward beyond that date because those sectors and so many others are going to need um, continued support. Then maybe moving on to some of the other supports that are out there for businesses that maybe don't have as big of a cash flow impact as the wage subsidy scheme, but still have positive impacts all the same. Um, the Revenue Commissioners is obviously a few, few initiatives that they have undertaken. Um, one of them is the charging of the interest and penalties on late filings from January to June of this year um, was automatically ceased for SMEs and larger companies were able to apply to avail of that. One of the new ones announced in the July stimulus the package was that previously profitable businesses can now avail of the early carry back of their 2020 losses um, against the 2019 profits to reduce their 2019 corporation tax liability. So that's going to assist with cash flow. And I suppose the other big one is the warehousing of the tax liabilities. And that's been so beneficial to many, many companies. So under that scheme, both PAYE and tax liabilities can be deferred um, while the business was unable to trade or was restricted during the COVID period period and then when the business does return to its new normal for the next the first two months of that that can also be included in a warehouse uh, a warehousing of the of the debts to get your hands on the scheme you've obviously got to contact revenue but you've also got to ensure that your tax returns are filed and that they're that they're up to date um, and when a company is then in a position to recommence their normal trading they've got to file and pay their current uh, returns as they as they fall due at the end of the 12 month period, there's the lower interest rate available going forward on the warehouse amount, amount until the amount is, is fully paid down. And tax clearance certs can still be um, availed of for companies that need them that, have, uh, that are using the, the, the warehousing facility. I think one thing that businesses should be mindful of in relation to the warehouse facility is just to be thinking ahead in terms of when that 12 month period is over and how are you actually going to cash flow the payment um, of those liabilities that then, that then crystallize. So I think. I think future cash flow management again is key here. And we've obviously also seen the VAT rate has reduced for a six month period from 23% to, to 21% with a 13.5% staying the same. In terms of the revenue though, I do think there's going to be big pressure on government to do something for the hospitality and tour, tourism sector going forward. It'll be interesting to see if the 9% VAT rate comes back in as part of, of, of the budget. Then on the rate side of things, companies have been able to avail of the six months commercial rates waiver up to the end of September 2020. And we also saw in the July package that the restart grant was increased up to a maximum of 25,000, which you can apply for through your local authority for businesses with up to 250 employees. So the restart grant was increased up to a maximum amount of 25,000, which you can apply for through your local authority for businesses with up to 250 employees. This is a really interesting one because the guidance implies 25,000 um, per business in total. But what we're seeing on the ground is it's 25,000 per rated business premises. 
Um, I've seen some companies going back to their local authority where they've received more than they expected and the local authority confirming that what was received was correct and that it's per rateable unit rather than per company. So there's maybe some confusion on this one, but with a positive outcome for businesses that are needing to um, avail of that support. Funding is so important for businesses as they're, as they're getting back on their feet. And uh, Tom mentioned there the uh, Sustaining Enterprise Fund, which is, the, is a fantastic scheme. Um, I'll just mention one or two others. The COVID credit guarantee scheme where an additional two billion of lending was made available. The purpose of that is to encourage additional lending to the SMEs by offering a partial government guarantee, which is currently 80% to the banks um, against any losses that might be incurred on those qualifying loans. Under the scheme, facilities from 10,000 euro up to a million euro um, can be availed of with up to 250,000 being unsecured. The funds can now be used to refinance um, existing debt, which wasn't the case pre-July. So that's a a new add-on from before. There's also the SBCI COVID Working Capital Scheme. So for eligible businesses, loans from 25,000 up to 1.5 million, with the first half a million being unsecured and with a maximum interest rate of, of 4%. We have seen a little bit of confusion in the market in terms of some of the SBCI facilities where companies are applying initially to the SBCI to get their eligibility code and assuming that once they have the eligibility code, they actually have approval for the facility. But what happens then is you must apply to your participating lender. So going to one of the pillar banks to apply for the loan and then they will impose their lending criteria to decide whether or not the funding can be drawn down. So it's really, it's directly with the lender where you find out if you're eligible for the the scheme. So look, I think there's lots of really interesting um, supports that are out there. As I mentioned, the Department of um, Enterprise Trade and Innovation's website is a great place to go to to get further details on it. There's lots of other vouchers and grants and they can get through the likes of Enterprise Ireland, Fall to Ireland, Board BIA and other such bodies. Um, So it's well worth spending a bit of time navigating around that site to see what's most appropriate for your business. And thanks a million for that. I think that gives us a really good comprehensive sense of what's out there for businesses. Um, Just to come back to Sustaining Enterprise Fund, um, Tom, can you tell us a little bit more about how it works? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the Sustaining Enterprise Fund, I suppose, we'll start off with the purpose and what it's about. I mean, it's there, and, and I suppose we've got the caption of, it's there to stabilize, reset, and recover. And I suppose what we're saying is the money is to be able to, to not only sustain your existing operations and, and what you're doing, but it's actually to try and accelerate the level of recovery. It's to, to help you in terms of pivoting into a new direction and, again, into this changing environment. And I want to restress there again, about just how important uh, you know the business financial planning grant is there particularly if you're going to avail of the other supports such as like as the SBCI because this is again is, is something to help you to go to the banks to show where your cash flow need is what your repayment capacity is uh, so again it, it's definitely something I would consider uh, availing of but in terms of those that, that we're looking to support and the sustaining enterprise funds what we're saying is anybody who is impacted sort of a 15 percent in in terms of um, their actual or their projected turnover or profit figure, or if they've seen a significant increase in their costs as a result of COVID. So like there's over 100 million of money uh, that's available to help with eligible companies. And what we're classifying as eligible companies are those companies that uh, sort of were employing 10 or more full-time employees uh, back back in February um, before all this started uh, and where they're manufacturing or they're internationally traded services. So just to say specifically, I suppose, what the offer is. And the offer, uh, like everything else uh, that has happened since March um, has evolved. And it's based on companies' feedback. You know, when we were looking at it, we were were understanding, you know, companies were in this retrenching situation. Uh, They they needed to come up with plans. They didn't know what to do. They didn't want to take on any more debt. And that's why, like, one one of the the, the biggest things that we've changed into it is there's a non-repayable element of the funding now of up to 50% of the package uh, to a maximum of 200,000. And that, to me, is a pretty big benefit. 
of it. So, so just to, to give an example, if, for example, a company, an established company was approved uh, 400,000, 200,000 of that will be what we're calling a repayable advance and 200,000 would be a non-repayable element. So in other words, you're only going to have to make repayments on 200,000. Um, now for early stage companies, that those companies that are, are traditionally uh, funded via equity, what it would be is that it would be a 200k equity investment and it would be a 200k uh, non-repayable um, support element. So just maybe to explain a, a repayable advance, uh, just a, it's a new term that a lot of people might not be familiar with. I think the easiest way to compare it is, is to a loan. Essentially, it's monies that we were given to companies um, and, well, they have to be repaid back. You know, repayment for these doesn't actually start until year four and is over by year five. So, I mean, that, that's, that's quite long-term funding. And again, uh, no impact, no negative of impact on a cash flow for until uh, years four and five. Um, it does have a 4% uh, administration fee or an annual charge, but the first six months of that is, is free. So, uh, so once again, um, no money is that start until year four. And look, what is the money there for? The, the money's there to support any uh, business plan like uh, what we want to do is we want to encourage companies to take uh, an element of risk to to change their direction to look at, at, at doing new things i mean in enterprise ireland we always want this money to leverage additional funds and this these funds can come from promoters uh, from the banks from venture capitalists from private equity uh, any other forms what we're we're saying is you know don't just have the state be the only ones that are that are putting up the the funds um, now, uh, one thing I would really sort of impress on people that this is time limited, okay, that the, we can do approvals of this fund up until um, mid-December. So really companies should be applying for this uh, now. Um, one thing I'd always ask a business to remember, though, is that Enterprise Ireland is a development agency. You know, we want our investment investments to sort of leverage a, a change of behavior um, that helps companies grow uh, into the future. So sometimes when companies engage with us, they feel, oh, no, you know, it's, it's a bit bureaucratical. This application form is, is too long. But the reality is those forms are, are designed around a business plan and it's asking questions of companies that they should be asking themselves. And the only companies that actually struggle with it are the ones that don't really have a plan on, on what they're going to do, uh, how they're going to change and how they're going to succeed in, into the future. So those application forms are absolutely worthwhile in doing. I'm, like We have development advisors who engage and work with you uh, closely in terms of, of how to do it, and not to mention our business financial planning uh, grant. So what I'd always say to people is don't just play lip service to it. It's like really really engage in it because it holds up a, a mirror to a company and it forces them to look closely at themselves. Um, and again, look, you know, sometimes the message is hard to hear and people don't like, like what it's been saying, but it's always worthwhile. And even if I direct you to, to listen to some of the case studies on, on our Enterprise Ireland website about companies that are being in receipt of this funding, you know, they, they, they said, some of them said it was a little bit tough going through the process. You know, we really challenged our plans. We made them relook at it, but the end Ended up with a much more robust plan and they all said it was worthwhile um but you know the sustaining enterprise fund is, is just one of our other supports i mean we have a lot of funding for innovation for competitiveness for diversification we have you know brexit supports we have the online uh, retail grant so so you know Anne mentioned there that, that there's just quite a lot of support so so what i'd be encouraging people is to engage with their development advisor go on the ei website i mean that the, there's definitely stuff there that would be more uh, that would be appropriate and would meet uh, a lot of companies needs thanks tom i know you talked about some really interesting uh, enterprise ireland client companies that have had to pivot pretty much overnight and refocus their strategy because their market has completely changed as a result of the pandemic and um, but i'd like also to talk maybe about some of those companies that have uh, by chance found themselves in the right place at the right time because of the pandemic and um, are there any winners in a pandemic 
this is a really interesting one, Elaine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the companies that I've been working with over the last few months have been really hard hit by COVID. We have the obvious ones like the pubs, the restaurants and the hotels and retail. But I've also been working with a number of English language schools who probably don't immediately jump into your mind when you think of initial sectors. But their business has just been decimated. Um, international students aren't flying into Ireland to learn English. And it's very hard to see when that's going to materially change. Many of those schools quickly adapted to offer online courses, but total revenue is incomparable to 2019 and additional support is going to be needed for that sector. But we've also seen some interesting trends in the retail sector. As we know, city centres are like ghost towns at the moment with very few workers coming back into the offices. A number of high street stores have closed like Debenhams or gone into a restructuring process like New Look. There's obviously been a bump in online sales, but we are seeing people going back to shopping locally. So whilst large city city retailers or big shopping centres might be in trouble. Some of the smaller local boutiques are doing a bit better than expected because people are now more focused on shopping locally. I wouldn't say they're a winner in the pandemic, far from it, but maybe the hit hasn't been as bad as might originally have been expected. But there are some sectors where we have seen a COVID bump. Medical, PPE, manufacturers, distributors and suppliers have seen an increase, particularly in the initial three to four month um, period. IT and related services are also doing very well. Most companies' IT infrastructure has been tested to the max over recent months with so many staff working remotely. So that sector um, is performing well. But we've also seen some companies do a great job at pivoting the business model to ensure survival and try and maximize whatever opportunities are out there. I mean, look at the restaurants um, who have been hit so hard. A number of them have switched their model to providing a takeaway service. And that's not turning the business into a gold mine, but it is keeping things going and creating a new income stream that will survive post-COVID. I mentioned the English language schools moving courses online and trying to find ways to diversify their business and manage things going forward. We've also seen a lot of companies being now focused on what they can do with technology and new opportunities that that might create for them going forward. I think it's much easier to be great at your job or in your sector when things are going well, but I think we all really show our true strengths as business leaders during the hard times. I know businesses are going through a really challenging time at the moment and there's no easy or quick win, but I think we should be really proud of the resilience and the agility and entrepreneurship our leaders are showing. And I know that that's going to play a big part as we look to real Ireland post-COVID. So Tom, coming back to you, what is your advice now to businesses on the best way forward? Um, is this the right time to batten down the hatches or be a little bit more brave? Well, I suppose, look, it's very easy for me to turn around and give the advice and say, be brave, take a risk. It's definitely the best way forward. But, you know, I, I'm not under the same pressures that the um, business owners are. I mean, they themselves know what they have to face. But I suppose instead what I'm going to say is I'm passing on the learnings from a multitude of other business owners who've been where they are and are starting to come out the other side. Uh, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to companies uh, is sort of stems from the fact of uh, fail to plan and plan to fail. You know, uh, I've had a lot of first-hand experience with clients, and I'm sure Anne can back me up on this where the company's view was that it was a waste of time um but what i always said to them is it's better to fail on paper than it is in real life and it's significantly cheaper any company that goes through the process uh you know they always view it as worthwhile in the end so you know in enterprise ireland we will help companies we will challenge their thinking we will ask them questions and it's a more robust plan for them to do it so what i'd be saying is you know, you need to, to sort of stabilize your business in terms of, and that is the part about battening down the, the hatches. So it's, it's looking about how you make yourself more lean and more efficient. And then it, it'll help you sort of reset and recover the business uh, for, for where you want it to go. So specifically, I suppose I'd be saying to people to examine, you know, their existing customers, you know, make sure that they're maintaining the relationships and look, Nobody is denying that in a virtual world, that's quite a hard thing to do. I mean, in Enterprise Ireland, we're helping companies, you know, win new customers with virtual trade missions. We have overseas offices that are focused on, on helping clients. And by listening to your customers, it'll help you identify ways in which you can repivot your business to help service their needs. Uh, what I'd be saying is, is look at your products. 
you know, they can be adapted, see what you can do uh, to a new need. Just take a look at CombiLift. You know, it's a forklift company. Um, I would say that 12 months ago, they couldn't have imagined uh, producing ventilator splitters. Change is bringing opportunity, and some companies are taking advantage of this in the new, the new world, and they're thriving. I mean, our online retail support has, has managed to help the, a lot of traditional retail uh, clients move into online sales. So, again, you know, th this is really important stuff. And again, another piece of advice is not just to think about, oh, COVID, COVID, COVID. I mean, you've got to consider the other stuff which is coming down the track. And of course, obviously the elephant in the room, Brexit, and it's fast coming down to us. So like what I'd be encouraging people to do now is that they're building a plan, not just to, to take into account the COVID, but also how they're going to respond to Brexit and any other industry specific things that's there for them. I mean, this is a real opportunity for them to get a lot of funding now to help them reposition their business so that they're not only surviving in these next few months, but actually going to be able to survive. The last thing I really want to point out to people is there is funding available. Please take advantage of it. You know, we've got the SBCI uh, funding in through the banks. We've got our local enterprise offices. We've got microfinance. You know, every one of them is open for business. Uh, we're especially open for business. So I'm encouraging anybody to come in and speak to us. You know, our funding is, is there basically to give people the scope to be brave. Uh, it's going to, to leverage additional monies coming in from investors or banks. And it's a really good way to de-risk projects. I mean, if you're getting a 400,000 package from Enterprise Ireland, that's 200,000 of that is non-repayable. That's a lot of money uh, to, to encourage companies to take a risk to, to play around with. Um, you know, so what I would ask people to remember is that Enterprise Ireland is a development agency and we're focused on supporting companies. Our goal is to help you grow and expand. So all our supports are, are, are both the soft supports and the funding supports are there to ensure uh, clients uh, rebuild their business and accelerate their recovery. So please, all I'd say is get in contact with your development advisor, or if you're not currently an enterprise arm client, there's, there's, we have a COVID-19 business response unit. So please engage with us. And sorry, Tom, just jumping in on the, the what you were saying there about the Sustaining Enterprise Fund. I mean, definitely one of the things that I'm seeing on the ground is that since the change on the 200,000 being non-repayable um, over the last few months, a lot more companies that were nervous about taking on debt um, have, have, have put their head up now and are, and are looking at that really seriously because not only is it great that up to 200,000 of it isn't repayable. For a lot of companies, the concern is taking on more debt at the moment when they haven't got full visibility on their, their cash flow and their ability to repay debt. But one of the really positive things about the Sustaining Enterprise Fund is the fact that your repayments don't kick in until year four and year five. And it's giving you that time and space to rebuild the business back up um, to a level where it, it, it can repay the debt, but also it's been able to use that funding in the meantime to, to right size and reposition the business. So I think that's a really important factor for, for businesses that may previously have been a little bit nervous about, about taking on an additional debt burden. Okay, so we're coming to the end of today's podcast. And Ed, I want to bring you back in here because uh, a lot of what we've been talking about has been about change and recovery. And I don't think you can talk about business really in any context uh, without talking about remote working and this immense shift that has taken place because of COVID. Um, in your work in professional recruitment, uh, do you have any sense at this stage that companies are starting to look at this in a strategic light uh, on both the HR or recruitment front? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I, I think there is a, a number of emerging trends coming out of the last six months. And there's been obviously a lot of fundamental shifts from what the traditional recruitment or hiring process would have looked like for a lot of companies. I think at this point, companies that are uh, continuing to hire or have hired over the last six months are pretty comfortable with hiring remotely now and conducting interviews remotely. Following on from that, I guess the big challenge for a lot of companies has been the onboarding process of new employees even logistically getting laptops, equipment and uh, everything out to them uh, wherever they may work has been a challenge, but then integrating them into a culture. And even from our own perspective in, in Phoenix, we hired uh, a number of people over the last six months and uh, was only really introduced to them face to face in the last six weeks. So that's been an interesting experience for sure. And I think that's been the, 
the big fundamental change to the hiring process or HR strategies that, that we've seen across our clients, we've essentially gone from one extreme to another, right? So fully office-based to now fully uh, remote during the lockdown period. And I think it will be more of a, a blended approach going forward to people working remotely and being office-based. I'm sure some people have seen the press releases from the larger tech companies across Ireland that have been quite extreme, in my opinion, um, not, not inviting people back to the office to maybe the back end of next year. And some, in fact, actually not uh, saying that they don't have to come back to the office ever, which is, as was interesting, specifically for those types of companies, considering uh, the attraction to them sometimes for, for talent is the, the on-site gym and free foods and social gatherings. So I'm not sure if they're shooting themselves in the foot, but we'll just have to see how that plays out over the next number of months. One interesting trend, I guess, that we have noticed in the last six months has what we're calling the decentralization of talent, if you want to call it that where people from uh, working traditionally in the, the major cities like Dublin have taken the opportunity, uh, now that they are remote working, to, to maybe move back to their hometowns or cities like Wexford or Limerick or, or Galway, for example. So in the long run, we're, we're unsure, I guess, what the impact will that, that will have on the, the culture aspect of, of businesses with a lot of their staff potentially working remotely 60, 70, 80 percent of the time, for example. One emerging trend, I guess, that, that has come up in, in, in the recent weeks has been around salary levels and whether companies, I guess, should be offering, in inverted commas, Dublin-based salaries uh, for Dublin-based jobs if they're working remotely in more cost-effective locations, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and actually really interesting, Stripe, the uh, online payments fintech company, announced during the week that in the US they're actually offering uh, employees $20,000 uh, who are open to relocating out of the major cities like San Fran and New York but they will be incurring a 10% pay cut going forward. So um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic of conversation going forward where people are, are essentially being paid depending on where they're working uh, rather than maybe being paid on um, the actual skill set or the, the job duties that, that they will have. So certainly one to watch for us going forward. And maybe it's just to compare it to, to the last uh, crisis that, that came up, which, you know, 2008, 2009. Um, I, I suppose a lot of companies, for want of a better word, battened down the hatches and rode out the storm until, until you know, everything could be right-sized again, again for themselves. I, I don't see this crisis in the same way. That, I mean, this is something that is hitting the entire globe at the exact same time. You know, it's not moving like in a wave across the way. And, and I really think um, if a company's plan is to sit there and ride out the storm, I, I, I think that they could be uh, ending up in a, in a lot of trouble for themselves down, down the line. So what I will be encouraging companies to do now is to be innovative and to look at the problems uh, with a cold, cold eye and say, okay, if I start off with a blank piece of paper, would I still be doing what I was doing this time last year? So if I was starting fresh, what would I do differently? And I, and I would encourage companies just to try and do that and, and to think differently. So that's it for this podcast. Thanks to today's panel, Ed, Anne and Tom, for your very valuable advice and your insights. And a big thank you to our listeners. We'll be back soon with the next instalment of Phoenix Talent Talks.